The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, December 8th, 2013. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And now with Sunday afternoon's questions and answers, here's Chris McCann. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday afternoon question and answer time. And during this time, we'll open up this room for anyone's question or comment, and each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways that were just mentioned. Well, we do have someone on the phone, so we're going to take our first call this afternoon. Welcome to our Sunday question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, good afternoon, brother. Um, In Genesis chapter 41, verses 32, it says, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It's because the thing is established by God, partly permitted to pass. I believe when, when we see God doubling up on verses, especially like we just read in Romans chapter 1, it means that God is trying to get our attention. So um, uh, could you just add on to that Romans chapter 1, uh, could you add on Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, please? Sure. Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Yes, I just wanted to add that in also because uh, it has a lot of the same meaning, a lot of the same words used, and it just shows how God they're trying to get our attention to let us know, and this was written, we know, over 2,000 years ago, but God's Word, again, as I said last week, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so it was for them then as well as it is for now. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for bringing up these verses. I um, actually thought about uh, reading these earlier and, and uh, didn't get to it, so I'm glad you, you mentioned it. Yes, God has a lot of um, negative things to say about what's going to happen to the people of the world at the time of the end. Well, thank you. And let's go to our next caller. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes. Hello, Chris. That that was very encouraging today, that lesson. And um, I have a question now about free will. I'm trying to better understand it. For a true believer, I know that we don't have free will when it comes to being saved, but how about free will when it comes to sinning? Well, you you know, um, on one hand, we have free will. We can make decisions to put on um, whatever kind of shoes we want to put on, uh, what color shirt we're going to wear, and and we have a choice. There's 10 shirts in the drawer, and and we pick one shirt. We, We have free will to do this. Now, the thing about God is that he knows all of these things in advance. And I don't know exactly what God is uh, controlling as far as those minute details, uh, but, but God also allows and permits sin in the lives of his own people. For instance, he may um, have a plan for us where he removes that hand of restraint, even in the life of a believer, and a believer um, goes a little deeper into sin, say someone like King David, God could have restrained him so that that never happened in David's life. There is no doubt that God could have prevented those sins from occurring in King David's life, but God did remove his hand of restraint, and he allowed 
David to be idle at a time when kings go forth to battle. He allowed David to go up at the rooftop at a particular moment when Bathsheba was bathing on another roof and and so on. And and yet God had purpose in all those things. Everything worked out according to his perfect will. And and yet he is God himself is never responsible for sin. He never he never is the one that uh, we can say made us to sin or is the cause of our sin. God just sometimes allows us to do what we would otherwise do naturally, even save. We're still in the unsaved body, and our our body naturally does want to sin, and so on. So um, God allows things and permits things, and sometimes these things are sinful. So would you say that in, in talking to somebody that we have a free will to sin, you know, and that freedom to choose. I don't think I would bring up that kind of language because, you know, the the whole terminology of free will gets people thinking a certain way. And and I think that uh, there's no need to even go in that direction. We, uh, we can tell someone God is sovereign and he is sovereign when it comes to salvation And yes, if we sin, we're responsible for our sin. That's probably the best way of putting it. We can't blame God. We are responsible for our sin. And and so um, I don't think we want to get into the area of whether we have free will to sin. It's probably not the best direction to go. Thank you. God bless. Well, thank you for your question. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday Question and answer program, please. Go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Uh, yeah, can I explain uh, uh, Psalm 107, verse, verse 23? Psalm 107, verse 23? Yes. Okay. It says, They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. Is that the verse? Yes, 23 and 24 to 25, these, yeah. These see the works of Jehovah and his wonders in the deep, for he commandeth and raises the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. Let me explain to me, 23 to 25, yeah. Well, um, the, the Bible speaks of ships um, at times to refer to the churches and and like for instance the ship in acts 27 um, is a picture of the new testament corporate church and so uh, did the church have business in great waters yes they were commissioned by god to carry the gospel to all the world and and so it was just like a ship that sets sail uh, with its merchandise and its its traveling to distant seas, so the church, which um, had the merchandise of the gospel, set sail. and And God actually speaks of the ships of Tarshish as another picture of the corporate churches that um, has valuable merchandise. and And so this business is done in great waters, and they see the works of Jehovah and His wonders in the deep, and and then. He commandeth and raises the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves. Then those on board the ship are made to fear. And so God uh, brought fear into the lives of some individuals within the churches and congregations. And and uh, that that's one picture that we can gather from this. And, and of course, at the time of the end, God raises up a storm that destroys the ship. And the ship is made shipwreck, and that is picturing the end of the church age. The ship can no longer travel the seas, no longer uh, do its business, and uh, the only thing that that um, is to be done is for the passengers of the ship to make it safely to land. And 276 souls did, and the number 276 um, relates to... 23. Uh, I think it's 12 times 23. 
so uh, that that's the general direction of the spiritual meaning that those verses would go in. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for bringing up those verses. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, Chris. Um, can you explain explain these two verses, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8, and Psalm 141, verse 5? Proverbs 9, 8 says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. And you want to compare that with Psalm 141.5? Yes. Okay. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. And Yeah, that's a good tie-in, because who is the righteous? Well, the righteous one is Jesus, and Jesus is wisdom. And in Proverbs 9, it, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. And here God is um, sort of uh, doing what he did with the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. In this case, the unsaved is called a scorner, and the saved is, is identified as a wise man. And uh, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. That means if you do reprove a scorner, he's going to hate you. But if you rebuke a wise man, he's not going to hate you. He's going to love you. And all of this can be tied to 2 Timothy 3.16 that says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the scorner, when the word of God reproves him, he doesn't respond well at all. He, uh, he hates it. And, you know, back at the end of Proverbs chapter 8, we, we read a very revealing verse. It says in uh, verses 35 and 36, again, this is referring to wisdom, and wisdom is personified as uh, Christ is wisdom. For whoso findeth me, Jesus, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of Jehovah. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. And, and so there, God is saying that there are those that hate wisdom. They hate Christ, and Christ is the embodiment of the Word of God. He is the Word made flesh. And this reveals that men hate the Word of God. This is why they don't want to do it. They don't want to submit to it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want the light of it to shine upon them. They want to get away from it. They hate it. They want to separate from it and live their life away, um, as far away as possible from the Word of God. And, and that's why if you reprove a scorner, and that would be with the Word of God, well, then he's going to respond in hatred, maybe by turning away from you, separating you from his company, or doing something like that. But on the other hand, if you rebuke a wise man, you can have two people and you speak identically to them both. You say the same thing, you quote the same scripture, and one is the scorner and he ends up hating it, and the other is a wise man and he ends up loving it because uh, one is Jacob and one is Esau. And, and God is applying his word to one, and, and the other is running from his word. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for those verses. And uh, let's go to a question from Pal Talk. The question is, can you please read Luke 15, 25? 
And the question is, who does the elder son represent? Luke 15, 25 says, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. The elder son um, is, is envious when he, he comes from the field, and he hears this party and this rejoicing, and, and he learns that it's because of his younger brother, the, the younger son of his father, who, who had um, gathered his inheritance and went to a far country and wasted it with harlots. And, and so the elder son uh, is, is very upset and angry because his father never gave him that kind of party where they made merry and, and slew a calf. And so the father tries to explain to him um, in verse 29, and he answering said to his, well, this is the elder son speaking to the father. He answering said to his father, lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Now the making merry in this chapter, as um, Jesus gave earlier parables, uh, one of a man who had a hundred sheep and one was lost, and then it was found, and and then one of a woman who had ten pieces of coin and one was lost and was found, and then it said, uh, likewise, there'll be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. So the make and merry is uh, picturing joy in heaven over a sinner that found repentance, that experienced the salvation of God. And that's why a kid was slain, a fatted calf, pointing to the fact that Jesus died as the lamb for that younger son. And, and that is what helps us to understand the elder son. He said, you never gave us me a kid. That is spiritually pointing to that Jesus, the lamb, the sacrificial lamb of God never died for him. And so the father says, son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. That is, um, for instance, to the Jews of the Old Testament who never became saved or to professed Christians of the New Testament, you have all the earthly blessings of my name. You you have the oracles and, and uh, the relationship with my word. You, uh, you have the blessing of living uh, to whatever degree you're able to, uh, according to my word, which will bring relative peace and, and happiness in this world to your life. You have all that I am able to give you, just as Esau could have all of the earthly blessing that remain after Jacob received the blessing of the firstborn. And, and, and so the elder son is typifying um, those that are not saved that have an outward relationship with God in the corporate church. But thank you for that verse. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program today. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, good afternoon, Chris. I have a question. I wanted to get the reference of uh, that previous lady was um, giving you reference in Psalms that was compared to Proverbs nine eight. And could you re could you give me that uh, reference in yes. Psalms again? Yes, it was Psalm one forty one verse five. Okay, and uh, I wanted to ask you a question about. Um, Second Thessalonians. Okay. Um, one moment. It's um, Second Thessalonians, uh, second chapter and um, verse three. 
If you read it, and I'll ask you the question, please. Second Thessalonians two verse three. Yes. Uh -huh. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And we we do understand it's talking about Satan, but I wanted if you could please explain. I mean, it's always through all the times it's understandable that Satan is uh, the son of perdition, which was, uh, I mean, how do we understand that he is revealed in this time when all through the time we knew that Satan is evil and he will be destroyed? Well, uh, here um, in the previous verse, God speaks about um, not being troubled is that the day of Christ is at hand. And so that day is the one that's that's in view here, the day of Christ, which would be judgment day, um, that that cannot come except there come a falling away first, which would be the apostasy of the church, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, again, this mystery even though it doesn't call this a mystery, it's also a mystery. This mystery has been revealed really um, only recently, as Mr. Camping uh, realized this, I don't know, a few decades ago. But if you were to look at um, church writings or, or commentaries um, that theologians have written, you're, you're not going to find Satan the one being discussed, but there's all sorts of men that are put forth as it, the likely uh, son of perdition. Well, I understand. So that the people and churches and theologians, they were always looking that there will be a man who will be born in this world who will be antichrist, and that's mm -hmm. what they are still looking for, I guess. And uh, this mystery is revealed that it's actually not going to be a man, but it's a Satan who has been in the world. And that's why it says here that um, the mystery is already mystery of iniquity. I think it's other words that says that it's already in motion, beginning from like from the times of the apostles. I think Mr. Kempin was referencing into. Mm -hmm. uh, Gospel of John or Epistle yes, of John. Yes, First John, the the verse that really helps define who the son of perdition is, is in First John, in chapter four, where it says um, in verse three, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and that would be taking into account or referring to Second Thessalonians, that the day will not come except the son of perdition be revealed. So here it's saying, you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. And that helps us to realize it can only be Satan, because first— uh, John, the first epistle of John was written in the first century AD, and the Antichrist was in the world then, and he was said to come. And and so we see that um, the only one who meets uh, that kind of criteria and can qualify is Satan. Thank you. And I have one more question for you. In that same um, epistle of John, chapter 1, um, verse, um, you could read six and seven. And my question is about verse seven, but I'll um, ask you a question after you read it, please. Okay. First John one verse six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. In this verse, 
one with another. Is it talking about a true believer and Christ, or is it talking about uh, true believers? Like the, the reason I'm asking because I was accused of by church people saying that I don't have a fellowship with church people, and they are explaining that this verse one with another is talking about Christians, fellow believers, believers, and I think it's talking about true believer and a Christ fellowship, one with another about true believer and a Christ. How, how do we understand this right? Well, you're, you're right that where it says if we walk in the light. Now, first of all, who is the light? But Christ is the light, and uh, the Word of God is the light. So if we walk in the light, we're walking in Christ, we're walking in the Word, as, and it, as it says, as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. It's referring to our walk in the light as Christ is in the light. It, it, it's not talking about other believers. Um, now there is, oh, if I can... Remember this verse. Um, there, there is a, a sort of fellowship that results if uh, a child of God keeps God's commandments. That would be walking in the light, and we have fellowship with the Lord. It we read in First John five, um, in verse two. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous so if we want fellowship or if we want to display love to our fellow believers as it says here um, in verse 2 by this we know we love the children of god then we do things god's way only by god's grace we obey his word, we keep his commandments, and that would be a demonstration of love for his children. And and therefore, if God says the church age is over and you must come out of the church and, and never return, as he has said, then a child of God has fellowship with God because he walks in the light, that's a commandment, and, and it's coming forth from the word of God. So he walks in that commandment and he has fellowship with Christ who is in the light and also is exhibiting love towards his fellow believer by keeping that commandment, according to 1 John 5, 2. Uh, we can even say it another way. There is no fellowship. Uh, I, I don't care how many people are gathered together. You have no right fellowship in the sight of God if you are gathering together in a way God would not have you to do. And since God ended the church age, uh, people can go to church and, and they can have um, coffee and tea and they can have a nice lunch with people. You can have a social gathering, but there is no Christian fellowship really taken place there because people are not encouraging one another in the faith. They are doing something that uh, really is leading to the ruin of their fellow believer. And, and so there, there's nothing good about that at all. Thank you. Thank you I, for thank you so much. And I appreciate it. And God bless you and your family. Thank you. Well, thank you for your call and for bringing up those verses. And we do have another question from Pal Talk uh, that we'll take at this time. The question is, um, does John 11.39 have anything to do with Judgment Day? The period of Judgment Day being over four years, I was wondering if that has anything to do with the timing of the 1,600 days of Judgment. John 11 and verse 39 Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he has been dead four days. Well, uh, 
the the resurrection of Lazarus pictures salvation. It, it pictures God saving sinners, and and God does all the action. He he is the one who commanded Lazarus to come forth. Lazarus was dead physically, just like people are dead in their sin. And could Lazarus uh, have responded to someone reading a verse telling him to believe? No, he was dead. And, and through the resurrection of Lazarus, God is teaching us that this is how he saves. We are spiritually dead in our sin. And God must grant us ears to hear and, and give us life to respond and come forth. Now, as far as um, Lazarus was dead and God allowed him to remain in the grave four days before resurrecting him, I don't think that relates to the four-year period um, of Judgment Day, even though the number four it is um, in view quite a bit. It, it's four years, that is May 21, 2011, until October 7th, 2015, is four years, four months, and 16 days, I think. And 16 is four times four. So uh, we, we do have the number four really uh, on display in that number of 1,600 days. And even 1,600 days um, is 40 times 40 or four times 10 times four times 10. And the number 40 points to testing as this is a time of severe testing, but it's also taking place all over the earth. The number four points to universality and it's the completeness of judgment. So we, we do see the number four. Um, perhaps there's some relationship because it, it is so uh, that the likelihood is, uh, and this is certain if we're correct, if, if October 7th, 2015 is the last day, and it happens to be the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, if it does work out to be the last day, then it will be the day of the resurrection for all of the saints. And, and so uh, there, there may be some um, tie in, but it, it's kind of remote. It, it, it's, it's not very straightforward at all with the, uh, the four days that Lazarus waited in the tomb. But thank you for that verse and your question. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good morning, Chris, um, or afternoon. Okay, my question is Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 through 3, and then verse 8. And I have another comparison with it, but I also have a question regarding 1 through 3 and just verse 8. Okay, Genesis 6, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Jehovah said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And then verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah. Okay, my question is, I always kind of thought that the, the term sons of God always applied to, you know, the, the true believers. But it seems like you can be sort of a true believer, but you're not like... He just said, Noah found grace, but they were sons of God. So like Solomon, we believe, you know, I used to think he was a saved person, but then, you know, reading from scripture, we find out he probably was not a saved son. So, and it says, no man knows, you know, not the son. So can it be also in that way that they are sons of God, but they're not really the elect people? Well, yes, Does that's that possible. Sense? That's po it, it, it could be that th this is the the line that should have known better they, these are the ones that had the truth and and they were taught the truth and um they probably had safe people in that line and well uh, maybe a couple we're we're early on here in earth's history but um it, but the the idea is that th this is where the the true gospel was 
and yet they still intermarried and they mix with the sons of men. And for instance, we, we have a good example of that a little further on in Genesis when um, the, there's a, a believing family um, with Abraham and then Isaac, and then Isaac has twin sons. And Esau, after a few years, he, he marries uh, one of the daughters of the land. And then he marries a second one, and he does it in some ways despite his father or despite his parents. And, and so uh, just, just imagine that idea, uh, except multiplied, and, and then uh, pretty soon you, it's hard to find the truth. And you, you can't distinguish between those that had the true gospel and, and those that, that had other kinds of gospels. They, they become one, just as the church of our day. Thank you, Chris. Was that it? Yeah, well, one more. So why would, over here it says the age of man will be 120 years. And then in Psalm 90, verse 10, he refers to the age of man being 70 and by strength 80 80 years old. So, Well, yeah, here God is not setting, in in Genesis 6, God is not setting um, a boundary on the lifespan of men. Because we know that Noah lived to be 600, and even after the flood, um, there were individuals that lived to be 200 or 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 older, and 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 so he's not setting a boundary. This is related to his coming to Noah, and and uh, it's probably an early forecast of the flood that he would have 120 years to build the ark, and it. Spiritually, it would point to the natural uh, life boundary of the world because the world really should have ended after 12,000 years of history, and 10 times 12 is uh, 120, because that's the number for fullness, and the Old Testament went uh, 11,000 years 11,006 years until the birth of Christ. And then when Jesus went to the cross, Satan is bound for a thousand years. So God does basically uh, use that kind of picture that the world in one sense is 12,000 years, 11,000 till the Messiah. Then the Messiah comes, Satan is bound for a thousand, and then Satan is loosed. Well, if you add the two together, that's 12,000, except that Satan was loosed in 1988 after nearly 2,000 years of binding, because the 1,000-year figure is just um, a type. It's not an actual figure, but he was loosed at the 13,000th year of Earth's history. And and so God um, does that where he'll— He'll say there's 12 tribes of Israel, but there's actually 13. There's 12 apostles, but there's actually 13. The world will last 12,000 years, but actually 13,000 years plus this period of judgment. Thank you so much, and God bless this fellowship. Well, thank you for calling and for um, sharing those verses and your question. And let's go to, um, see, I think we have another question on Pal Talk. Okay, the question is, uh, what do you think of this reasoning? Okay, Matthew 5, 45, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. This verse refers to the spiritual son, Christ and his salvation program, and spiritual rain, the Holy Spirit, the... um, the salvation program and blessings of the Holy Spirit on non-elect people ended precisely when Judgment Day started. That ending of the sun and rain on Judgment Day implies that that's the nature of God removing his hand of restraint. That was how the restraint worked, and that is how it stopped. Um, I was reading that from the note. I, I want to take a look at the verse in Matthew 5. Let me begin reading in verse 43. You have heard that it has been said, 
thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So so the the comment from Pal Talk is that we know um, uh, that the Great Tribulation period, the last about 17 years, was also the time of the latter rain. God was spiritually sending forth the latter rain to uh, to bless the inhabitants of the world, to save a great multitude. And spiritually, the sun is shining. But then on uh, May 21, 2011, immediately after the tribulation, and since the tribulation ended, the rain ceased, and the Bible says the sun was darkened. And, and so I, I think this does uh, relate to that, where God is basically speaking of the outpouring of his gospel, and, and he likens that to the signing of the sun and to the uh, pouring out of the rain, and, uh, and he does that to all because we were to carry the word of God into all the world and not knowing who the elect were, meant we had to share with everyone. We we were not to be respecter of persons. We're not to judge and think, well, this one's saved and that one isn't, so I'll save with this one. I'll share with this one. No, we had no idea. So we we shared uh, with all. And and just as God does so physically with the the literal sun in the sky, and the literal rain. But I think, yes, you're correct with the spiritual meaning of this, and thank you for bringing up this verse and uh, for your comments concerning it. Well, let's go to the next person on the phones. Welcome to our Sunday question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, Chris. Yes, hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, Could you look at uh, Joel chapter 2? Joel 2. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Verse seven to nine. I'm particularly interested in uh, verse nine. Okay. Joel two seven. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Yes, isn't that interesting? Yes. Um, <laughs> did you have a question about verse 9? Yes. Uh, obviously, this is talking about true believers. Um, the question I have is uh, verse 9, where it says, uh, they, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Mm-hmm. Uh, can we look at it as um, uh, entering the windows like a thief? Could it perhaps be understood that the believers did warn the churches and the world about Judgment Day, you know, by bringing the true gospel? Therefore, you know, coming coming as a thief in the night. I just uh, wasn't too sure. About well, the- well, yeah, we're we're not used to uh, reading of the believers, and you're right. The the army in view here is picturing the army of God. This is the same army as the locusts in Revelation chapter 9, or this is the army that's on white horses with the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 19. It is the complete number of God's elect. It is all whose names were recorded in the Lamb's book of life, those living upon the earth and those that have previously been saved, and the fact that God saved them all is the primary means of judgment upon the inhabitants of the earth. And, and that's why uh, God is using the language as though they are destroying, because there is no more room for anyone else. There is no one else's name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. All 
of the elect have been found. And, and so this is bringing destruction to all the unsaved. Uh, and they shall enter in at the windows like a thief, just as um, uh, we are the body of Christ. And, and just as God uses uh, Christ, for example, is the one, uh, how beautiful are the feet of him that brings glad tidings of good news. We read in one, one scripture, I think that's in Isaiah, and then in Romans, it says, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of good news, because God moves in his people to accomplish his purpose. Therefore, the Bible says he does it, and yet uh, there is also the reality that we do it. And, and so the Bible can speak of either or and be correct. And May 21, 2011 was Judgment Day, and Christ came as a thief in the night. And uh, just as he came as a thief on the church, and the church was completely ignorant that they had their blessings stolen from them, all valuables spiritually taken away. And, and to this day, they're ignorant that he came in judgment upon them. Well, likewise, Jesus came as a thief on that day, May 21, and he stole uh, the valuables, even though the world would never admit it, the valuables of the world which is the salvation of God, the, the possibility that they might become saved, the light of the gospel. All these things were taken away from them. And, and also, just as Christ is the thief, we are his body. God left us on the earth. And so as, as uh, we're alive and remaining on the earth, it as though we are thieves uh, after him in this sense because of what he has done in stealing the world's blessings away. Again, he used the believers. Uh, he uses us as a battle axe in the sense that uh, he acted upon us in saving all the whole company of the elect, and, and this is the means of the judgment. So uh, he he uses this same kind of language. And then verse 10 pinpoints the time when it takes place. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And we know from Matthew 24, 29, this happens immediately after the tribulation. And the tribulation ended after 23 exact years on May 21, 2011. And then in verse 11, and Jehovah shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of Jehovah is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And, and so God is executing his word now at this time, because we only know about judgment day from the word of God. And, and so it is the Bible, uh, as it says in the Gospel of John, uh, the words that I speak unto you, they shall judge you in the last day. And, and this is the last day. It's a prolonged period of time, but it's all the last day. And the Word of God is judging the unsaved of the world at this time. Okay. Can I ask, just one more. Can I ask one more question, please? Yes. Um, Isaiah. 27, uh, verse 12. Isaiah, 7. chapter 27. Yes, yes. Okay, 12 to 13. Uh, 12 and 13, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that Jehovah shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship Jehovah in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Um, th this is speaking of in that day, which goes back to verse 1 of Isaiah 27. In that day, Jehovah with his sore and great 
and strong sword, that's the word of God, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, that would be Satan, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And, and that took place on May 21, 2011. That was Judgment Day. Satan was put down and deposed. And, and so uh, Isaiah 27, even though some of it's complicated and hard to understand, it's speaking of the day of judgment, and, and God is talking about gathering his people uh, one by one, and, and that would relate to this time of, of uh, reaping or, or the, the feast of ingathering um, has to do with, with gathering together the elect. Okay, thanks very much, and may the Lord continue to bless uh, you, Bible Fellowship, with the truth of his holy word. Thank you. Thank you for those verses. And let's um, let's see. We have another question from Pal Talk, and this question is: Please explain First Corinthians eleven ten. What does God mean when He talks about the women's head and the angels? First Corinthians eleven in verse ten. For this cause, ought the woman to have power or authority? That could be understood as authority. The Greek word could be um, power or authority on her head because of the angels or the messengers. And the only way to understand this is to go back to the earlier verses in 1 Corinthians 11, where God, um, he, he really has some strange language here. But let's read in verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So we have three headships here. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, it's interesting that Christ is the head of every man, and, and the head of Christ is God, and both Christ and God are eternal God. And that would leave just that other headship, the head of the woman as the man, as sort of um, not quite fitting with the first two heads, as Christ is eternal God and God is eternal God. Well, why is the head of the woman the man? Uh, we understand this passage when we realize that when it says the head of the woman is the man, that the man is referring to the spirit of of God or the law of God. As mankind, the woman here would be representative of all mankind, is married to the law of God. The law of God is the head of the woman. And that way, each of the heads would be eternal God. Christ would be a head. The, the, the law of God or the spirit of God would be a head and God himself would be ahead. So that matches up very well. Then it goes on in verse four, every man praying or prophesying. And remember in the Bible, praying and prophesying has to do with, with sharing the word of God or bringing the gospel. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Well, who is the head of every man? That's Christ. Does Christ need a covering? No. No, it, it, Christ doesn't need a covering, and, and so trying to put a covering over him would dishonor him. Then verse 5, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Now the woman is a representative of mankind. Mankind in his natural state is unsaved. He's married to the law of God. Therefore, every woman that prayeth or prophesieth, if any person takes the gospel and begins to share the gospel, and yet their head, which is the law of God or the spirit of God, who they're married to, does not have a covering, they dishonor their head. Why? Because the law is condemning them. It, it's just like the Ark of the Covenant. 
the the ark contained the law of God, and over the law was the mercy seat. Well, likewise, over the head of the woman, who is the man, who is the law of God, must be some covering for sin. And if there is no covering, then anyone attempting to bring the gospel, praying or prophesying, is dishonoring that head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. That is as if her head were bald, That and, and baldness points to nakedness, and nakedness indicates their sins are exposed before God. That's why the woman needs a covering over her head, who is the man, the law of God. She needs the blood of Christ to cover her sins so that she can then pray and prophesy or bring the gospel. As King David said in Psalm 51, um, well, what did he say? <laughs> He, he said in Psalm 51, um, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And, and then down, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, verse 12, and then verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. First, save me, O God then he would become a means of bringing the gospel to others. And, and that's basically what this verse is saying. And, and then um, verse 6 says, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And again, this is pointing to spiritual nakedness, baldness of the head. And, and it's just emphasizing the woman needs a covering. No, not a hat. She doesn't need a, a one of those little uh, doilies or whatever they call them, the, the little things that, that some churches stipulate that the women must put on their head in order to cover their their head. The, the Bible doesn't care anything about that. A woman doesn't have to wear any kind of a hat. God is concerned with the spiritual condition of the woman and the man, and they need the covering of salvation. And verse 7 says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Again, why not? Because his head is Christ. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. And then verse 8 says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power or authority on her head because of the messengers. That is, the woman is to have this spiritual um, head covering, which brings salvation, which gives her authority to carry the gospel as a messenger of God. And, and also she would receive this as a result of other messengers of God. So I'm not exactly sure uh, which way to go with that because of the angels, but that's basically the idea that this passage is getting into. But thank you for that verse, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. McCann. Um, your lessons in uh, Chapter 8 of Revelation have just just been so uh, excellent. I hope to encourage you. Um, I had two questions. I happen to be alone, so I don't, I can't seem to find another uh, Christian, and I seem to have studied my kingdom parables incorrectly, and I, uh, I want correction, so uh, don't be afraid you'd hurt my feelings. Of the uh, Luke uh, chapter 15 uh, uh, parables, I'll just quickly say how I understood them and then uh, have you correct me. I had thought because of the nine coins and the 99 sheep that I could bring that up to um, May 21, 2011, at the time the kingdom would reach completion. And of the four examples, the coins, the sheep, and the two sons, I was going to the further extent of those that would comprise the kingdom, which would be Christ and, and his, his body of complete elect. 
of the sheep. They would be the ones in the church in the tribulation time that would be uh, uh, found and leave the, the churches and uh, uh, receive uh, the salvation out and outside of, of the church. Uh, the coins are the uh, at the very end, when people that had never heard at all, their, their image was Caesar, and now they've heard the truth, and now they become coins of gold. And then of the two sons, there were those that were in deep sin and fornication and rebellion against the Word of God, and he was saved. And now comes the very last group, which I'm hoping I was one of those, which uh, were the most decent, moral, Bible-reading virgins you could find, but we had it all wrong. And so at the end, we're, we're uh, angry. I was angry at you. And then I looked up believe everywhere it was at in the Bible and then pushed it away and thought, he's right and I'm wrong. And at the point that brother is angry, then there's one last line in the sentence in this parables, and that's when the father says, all that I have is yours, and that he became a joint heir with Christ, and he too received salvation, and that was the first being the very, very last one in. Do I have that wrong? Well, uh, concerning the the elder son, yes, um, he uh, is someone that is really representative of of people that identify with the gospel but never truly become saved because a calf was never slain for him. And notice notice his reaction. Uh, he, he's not happy at all that his brother was lost and is found. Uh, he's uh, angry at his brother. And it, it really, um, he actually um, is used as a, a pretty good type of, uh, someone who is in the corporate body. And, and you know how God does um, speak of a Jacob and an Esau or, or a Cain and an Abel. And here, I think with these two brothers, he's doing the same thing. One becomes saved and the other does not. Yet the father, it, it reveals uh, God's level of care towards those that even um, have that outward relationship with him that that are in the churches or that were a part of Israel. God does have a certain level of concern and care for them. And remember what he said um, in, in the book of Romans, where um, the Apostle Paul was speaking about, uh, has God cast away the people which he foreknew? And, and um, well, maybe that's not it, but the Lord was talking about giving them the oracles of God in Romans 3, it says in verse 1, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So here God, is, the question is, what advantage the Jew, what profit of being circumcised? And that would be, um, of being of the nation of Israel and could say the same thing. What advantage the Christian? What profit of, of water baptism? Well, much every way. Chiefly, unto them were committed the oracles of God. That is a great earthly blessing as well as a spiritual blessing. There is a blessing if you have relationship with the Word of God because it gives wisdom even on an earthly level, and uh, in the Second Thessalonians study, we're looking at the mystery of iniquity, and we can see how the presence of the Word of God could aid the individual because the Holy Spirit would use that Word to help restrain sin to a greater degree in the lives of people throughout the history of the world up until the time of the end. And, and so there was blessing in the restraint of sin. Just think of all the heartache and, and grief that sin brings when people uh, go after it uh, today with alcohol and drugs and, and sexual diseases and, and just the trouble people get in because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and they're spared a great deal of that even if they're living just a moral life without salvation. So there, there are many blessings, and, and those are the blessings that God can give 
to um, and has given to those that are in a relationship with him only on that outward level and, and not truly saved. Uh, yes, I understand that. And your Romans uh, a reference references back to your uh, Luke 15, verse 2, because the, para- the Pharisees were murmuring about his mm. receiving the sinners, and they are exactly the ones yes. who had the benefit of the law. Okay, yeah. I, th- yeah. thank you. I, and then I had one other question. Uh, on the two altars, uh, the golden altar where the incense was offered, that only the high priest went into, that would be, depict Christ going to that altar. Uh, the brazen altar where the sacrifices are made, either Christ would be our Passover lamb or those that were not saved would pay for their own sins. Do I have that right? Well, um, the e- either altar can be used as a figure of of Christ or uh, of the atoning work of Christ, because on on the one altar would be offered burnt offering, and and so um, in Hebrews thirteen. In Hebrews 13, it says um, in verse 10, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us... Go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So here it says we have an altar, and that altar, um, in in this case, I think it's referring to the altar where the the animals were slain, and and that would have been not the golden altar, but the the bronze altar, and and it's also referring to Jesus in um, Revelation six when it speaks of the souls of them are under the altar, that more than likely also um, the picture would be that brazen altar because it's as though the blood flowed down to cover those under, underneath uh, God's elect. And, and so either altar, you know, just about everything to do with the tabernacle, if not everything, pictures Christ. And, and, and so the the whole sacrificial system and all the various sacrifices picture uh, the Messiah. They picture the atoning work of Christ. Thank you. Thank you You're very welcome. much. And may I encourage everyone that's with the Bible. You have a lot of us out here, and um, uh, many of us are looking to the website for our feeding. If uh, uh, any way that could uh, uh, stay more current, we sure would appreciate it. Take care now. Well, thank you for your your question and your comments. And uh, let's see, we have another question from Pal Talk. Can you explain Jeremiah one eighteen for me to understand? Well, uh, I hope so. Jeremiah one verse eighteen. I'll start reading in verse seventeen. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them. All that I command thee, be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith Jehovah, to deliver thee. Well, here... God is speaking to Jeremiah the prophet, and God has a very difficult task for Jeremiah to perform. And he he's encouraging Jeremiah, don't worry. Uh, yes, they're going to fight against you, but I am going to be with you, and I am going to cause you to endure and and to um, to gain the victory. And, and nothing that they assault you with is going to be able to overcome you. And, and this was the case when we read the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, again and again, is proclaiming um, the, the word of God that is 
pronouncing judgment upon the people of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, and, and they do come against him. They do constantly fight against him. They throw him into prison. They, they throw him into a miry pit. They speak evil of him. They desire to kill him, but they're never able to do it. And, and this spiritually would relate to God opening up the scriptures uh, during the Great Tribulation and revealing to his people the end of the church age and encouraging his people to declare it, to speak these things and not to be concerned uh, of the reaction of those in the churches. And, and did those in the churches and congregations fight against the idea the church age was over and, and God's spirit was not with them and Satan had entered in? Yes, Oh, they, they were extremely angry at this kind of teaching, and they tried to do everything they could to uh, quiet it. They, they tried to pronounce edicts and, and uh, make declarations of heresy and, and, and speak of those who brought this message as a cult and, and so forth, but they never could... Um, quieted the the message of the end of the church and all of the truths that God opened up continued to spread and and God said actually in Luke 21 in a chapter right in a in the midst of a chapter that is dealing with the judgment on the churches and the end of the world he says in uh, Luke 21 verse 15 for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And did they gainsay and resist? Yes, they did, but not uh, legitimately. Uh, anyone can, can gainsay and, and say um, and revile people, or anyone can resist something. You can't stop someone from resisting, but there is a proper resistance with the word of God when, when um, someone is teaching an untruth and, and so you show them a correcting verse. That could not be done. And true response in coming back with the scripture to disprove the teaching of the Bible could not be done. So God says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. It's basically... Um, restating what was said to Jeremiah, and and yet it was spoken to all of God's people living at the time of the Great Tribulation. But thank you for that verse, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, that prior woman uh, was talking about the eBible Fellowship website, and I was wondering if there... I tried using that email address on there this past week, and it didn't work. I think it was the one that said, contact us at ebiblefellowship.com. Is there another one that we can use to, yes. like, for example, yes. email uh, questions? I, yes. Uh, I'm sorry if that didn't work. Uh, we, uh, it, it's a pretty big site, and there's uh, only basically one person taking care of it. But mm -hmm. you can write to ebiblefellowship at juno.com, and you can, you can say whatever you like to say uh, and, and just send it to, to that email address. Is it okay if we put questions in there for the Sunday morning question and answer? Yes. That uh, yes, that's fine. Um, I'm not saying that, that we'll get to them, but—, but Sometimes we don't have as many questions, and, and we, can, we can take a question from there. Okay, so I have ebiblefellowship at juno.com. Is that correct? That's right. All right. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program today. Please go ahead with your call. Oh, praise God. Uh, thank you for the studies, Chris. Uh, Revelation 8 studies were fantastic this last week. Uh, this morning, the study and this question and answers on Romans 1. Boy, is it 
uh, have I really seen the sin uh, gather around, but uh, this is it. Uh, we're in that uh, judgment day. Uh, very good study. Um, e, uh, see YouTube, if you go to YouTube.com uh, and uh, you can see eBible Fellowship and all of the uh, different studies are put up there, too. So if people want to go to YouTube, they can go there. Yes, yes, thank you. The, um, uh, YouTube is um, uh, easy to navigate. Uh, you, can, you can find, uh, for instance, if you go to the main page, eBible's main page, you can scroll down and you can see all the studies of Revelation um, on uh, in, in one area, and then all the studies in Second Thessalonians, and all the studies of um, Isaiah 24 or, or whatever, and so it's easy to use, and and it's um, pretty much up to date. Yeah, and and you have another site also. It's called uh, eBible the number two dot com, eBible two dot com, and there again, like you say, one of the subtitles is YouTube. And it just takes you directly into all the studies. So that's another very good site that will uh, lead you right into all the prior studies uh, when they get posted. They don't get posted immediately. But um, also, you did very good uh, on the Esau uh, uh, verse of Jacob. Esau said somewhere uh, uh, when Jacob came to him, Esau said when Jacob wanted to give him. Uh, something he says i have enough so uh god does uh make the people of the world satisfied with what they have uh and just like the prodigal son you were talking about uh when the father said to to the other son well i've given you all uh yes that's what they get they get this what god gives them this world they have the scriptures maybe but they don't have what the prodigal son has, and of course that is Christ's eternal life. But I see God does all things well. You've really had some good studies lately, and I just uh, appreciate you hanging in there, and, uh, you know, from God's mercy and grace, it's all the glory, but uh, you've been feeding the sheep, and I, I just so appreciate you uh, hanging in there. You did so good on um, delineating all of those differences, in, um, again, in Revelation 8, 7, 9, 10, 11, and put it together on the seven woes, how they all had to be done. And it, uh, anyway, we're all here today. Uh, bless you, Chris. Keep going. Boy, I can just see it so clear now. And I see the, the hatred of people, but I understand their fierceness, like in Romans chapter 1 and all this other stuff. But there again, I rest in Christ, and I, I, I just pray. And, and live in, and enjoy with Christ. Boy, what a time, huh? Thanks a lot, Chris. God bless. Well, thank you for calling in and for sharing uh, your comments and for mentioning those other websites. Um, maybe somebody can, can find uh, some things they're looking for in those other sites. Well, um, we have come to the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for sharing your questions and your comments and especially the Bible verses that we had an opportunity to read and consider. Um, shortly, we'll, we'll go back to our online fellowship, and um, there'll be some more scripture reading and hymns. And uh, also tonight, if you're available on Facebook, we'll have a, our Sunday live question and answer group from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And all are welcome. Uh, if, if you are on Facebook, you can just uh, join the group uh, and or you can contact me, Chris McCann, on Facebook, and I'll uh, let you know how you can join the group tonight. But uh, for now, I'll wish everyone a good afternoon and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.